really cool about these uh, seven factors for awakening is in the seven factors of awakening, there's really, it's almost like a checklist, something that we can reflect on throughout our day and throughout our practice and identify like what might be off. Like the way I've been really understanding the seven factors of awakening is it's all about our balance. Like how can we create a sense of balance in our practice? Um, so the seven factors, we're going to come back to them many times, but just to give ourselves, oh, I think we need to say it's being recorded and that's okay. So the seven factors are mindfulness, investigation, energy, joy and rapture, relaxation, concentration, and equanimity. And it's, yeah, it's really nice to just slow down and, and pay attention to each of these. But I will say this first one, mindfulness, it's kind of a big deal, right? So for folks who are coming here often, like, so nice to see you again. For folks who might be coming here the first time, welcome. We've been making our way through this beautiful text. And I, I looked at my notes. We actually have taken now almost a five week diversion away from the text and the story time, which I really love the stories in this book, the historical life of the Buddha and all his many um, adventures and experiences. But we've really taken a pause to just focus on the Satipatthana Sutta. So this four foundations of mindfulness. This will be our last week on it for now. So if you're like, I can't wait to have the stories again, you're in luck. We are one of my favorite stories in the entire book. We'll pick up next week. But I, it's been really nice to kind of really look at the Satipatthana Sutta. And, and again, we're catching the Buddha. <clears throat> he is now in his early 50s. He's been a, an awakened being for about 12 years, has thousands of students all over, and is continuing to refine what he's teaching and how he's teaching it. A lot of people, and especially in certain traditions, believe that the Satipatthana Sutta is the most important sutta. In the tradition that I am, that I am a student in, that I uh, really appreciate and feel at home, that it's not our most important um, in Tibetan Buddhism, and yet there's just no way to deny how important really getting the sense of mindfulness is. And so I want to start off with a really silly, but I, in this day and age, but I think really important question, which is, what is mindfulness? I think I've really tried to avoid the majority of my teaching talking about mindfulness because I'm so over it. Um, and it's not that I'm over the practice of mindfulness. I'm over the overuse of the word and the way it's been distilled and applied to everything and <clears throat> that, um, yeah, I think that's just created a little bit of fatigue maybe for me. And yet there's just no denying how important it is. And I would love us to kind of really think about it. Like this is the first of the seven factors of mindfulness. And if you look at a lot of the commentary of these seven factors, a lot of it really has this kind of proposition that without mindfulness, none of the rest will manifest. Like we really have to have a direct experience and feeling of mindfulness. And the Satipatthana Sutta is bringing mindfulness to our breath and our body, our feelings, our mind. And then in this last phase to all these mental formations. So mindfulness is kind of woven within the Satipatthana Sutta. So yeah, let's, let's start with a, uh, a pop quiz for everybody. What's mindfulness? Or how do you understand it? Yes, please. And if you don't mind, yeah, name and then using the mic here. I would say it's being present. Being present. Great. Opposed to ignorance. Mm. Opposite to ignorance. Oh, I like that. Interesting. Anybody else? What is my most? Come on in. And again, uh, I was reading. Uh, still sorry, um, I'll allow you to unmute. Thank Go. you. Thank you. Hi. Hi, uh, hi, hi, Eve. I wrote being vigilant of our thoughts, words, and actions. Watch our intentions. Yeah, being vigilant of our thoughts, words, and actions <clears throat> with intention, was it? Uh, watch our intentions. Watch our intention. Yeah. Yeah. 
Anybody else? What is it? What does it feel like? So we're talking about the definitions. How about what does it feel like? What is mindfulness like qualitatively, phenomenologically in our moment to moment experience? Connected. Connected to ourselves, to others? Every cool. okay. Beautiful. I think that in the body, when I'm focusing on my body, I, I, I can understand my feelings more because my body is like telling me what I'm doing. Yeah. So being in the body, like mindful of the body and aware of your feelings because you're listening to the body in a way. Yeah. Anybody else? When we feel mindful. Well, I think that the John Cabot Zinn, who you don't have to be first, you just have to be first to market. <laughs> True. The guy, first guy to slap a price tag on mindfulness. Right. Yes. Uh, I think his definition is something to the effect of being, you know, present in this moment and without judgment. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's just like being aware of what is going on for me emotionally mentally physically not judging it but being aware that i could very well be causing myself a bad time yeah and i don't gotta do that yeah beautiful yeah first to market i that is hilarious i bet john would also love that um i'm gonna share that with him uh, yeah. The other way it feels is the chatter goes away the chatter goes away the internal chatter the narrative right yeah it feels, um, for, for me, it feels a little bit like there's my senses and my awareness internally and externally. And when I, if I try to control it and I can reach in it, like I can put out a pseudopod of sensation, mm -hmm. reach for something, yeah. but then I'm like pulling sensation away from other things. Mm -hmm. If I reach too far, it'll kind of get really thin and like I'm reaching um or it gets all like crunched up and it feels like mindfulness is when whatever is the correct amount of sensing just kind of spreads out mm -hmm. it doesn't go any further than it needs to and doesn't yeah go but also goes as far as it can yeah beautiful without i mean <clears throat> the simple way often you see in the traditions described like without grasping without aversion you know so we're like not leaning towards we're also not trying to get away from um yeah and <clears throat> there's different interpretations of the word mindfulness often you'll hear a definition of bearing in mind remembering and what we're remembering is to be in this present moment but also that aspect the non-judgment um i think discerning might be a little closer we talked about that word last week discerning and there has to be some element of, of wisdom in our mindfulness or else we can really find that um it's kind of it's kind of missing an essential quality i often think of mindfulness as including a sense of generosity and kindness within it though i wouldn't say that we're being generous and like it's not a deliberate cultivation of those like loving kindness is it's rather that what is the quality of this mindfulness and attention and very often we use the word attention interchangeably with mindfulness and it's an important aspect right um it's really important to have this kind of concentration in the present moment and as some people said here through all of our senses right it's not something that's happening only in our thoughts it's something that we are really experiencing through our senses but also it is that like deliberate <clears throat> placing in some ways like planting ourselves right here um which is hard and if someone who has never meditated just heard you're telling me that all this is is being right here in this moment like that's not hard but anyone who's tried it knows that, you know, having <clears throat> some volition over where our attention is, is unbelievably hard. It escapes so quickly. And it is interesting, too, that it's like this, it's foundational practice, but it's not, I think where I sometimes struggle with the way mindfulness is used is it's almost as a synonym for all meditation. But we know that there's at least it you know, what you hear a lot in Tibetan Buddhism is there's at least 84,000 meditations, 
right? And that's more than mindfulness. It's an essential ingredient for many and in possibly all meditations, this ability to really feel our present moment, be in our present moment, but we don't have to stop there. You could arguably, especially when you think of um, practices of focused attention like shamatha, you can do that all the way to enlightenment. You don't need any other practices. And yet there are many other practices and some of them help get rid of those obscurations, those hindrances we talked about last week. Sometimes you don't, you can't just attention your way through a lot of these blockages. Sometimes the heart needs to soften. Sometimes our, our you know, ability to ground requires that we have a little more sensory um, calibration or attention. Um, what I think is interesting, especially in these seven factors of awakening. So the seven factors of awakening described in a Satipatthana Sutta, it actually refers back to an earlier Sutta that we went quickly through maybe four or five months ago. And these seven factors, like bringing them in as part of this four foundations of mindfulness, it really helps cover everything that's going on in the mind. So the Buddha is asking that we really pay attention to the contents of the mind and what's happening in the mind. So last week we paid attention to these blockages and obstacles. And then this week we pay attention to these factors that support awakening. And mindfulness, it's, it's, it's the building block. But what comes right after in this list, which I think is so interesting, is investigation. So that is definitely not as a common term, right? You don't hear, there's not, you know, uh, branded courses on investigation. Maybe there should be, you know, I think it's, I think it's really interesting, this idea that if we are mindful, if we are able to have that presence and this kind of, I think of it as this like pliancy with our presence. So we don't mean I'm going to stay in this present moment no matter what, right? It's not this like tense presence. It's this kind of pliancy of body and mind presence. And when that happens, like we investigate, we become curious about what's happening. But the investigation isn't with an agenda. The investigation isn't, I got to figure this out. Like what's happening? It's this investigation, again, that's free from grasping and free from aversion. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden the present moment becomes like an unbelievably radiant jewel. Like we see all the facets of it. And it's, it's delightful. So the investigation is like, wow, now that I'm actually here, it's kind of almost swampy warm today <laughs> you know now that i'm actually paying attention to this moment i recognize there's like a moisture quality to this day that i haven't noticed this summer in san francisco yet which is true right it's anyone notice that it's kind of i didn't notice it till i was trying to pay attention to something new but just that investigation um and interestingly kind of what comes up uh in the investigation is we're able to see more clearly the nature of reality as it is. So we start to, we're mindful, we're just being with what's here, and we recognize things are changing. We recognize things are connected. So it's just really beautiful how these two come together, <clears throat> this mindfulness and this investigation. And this is the first kind of couple that I'd like us to practice together. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit more about investigation. Anyone have a sense of that? What is it like when we are so curious in our mindfulness that we investigate? Does that resonate? Is that like, oh, yeah, I know that factor. I'm curious. Yeah. Any thoughts, reflections, questions on the investigate piece? Yes, please. To me, sometimes there's moments where things are like that, that everything starts connecting to each other. Yeah. There's all those elements that have been memorized, all those tools, those uh, maps that you had, and all of a sudden you realize you're good, you have everything, actually, to understand this or that. Yeah. yeah. So kind of in that 
again, that pliancy, that presence, that mindfulness, you recognize that you have everything. When you were looking, mm -hmm. things, maybe you were investigating, you didn't realize was were the tools. Yeah. But you had them all along. Yeah. It's been happening to me recently mm. more and more. Yeah. Um, just realized that I had the same book at home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> start reading and it started making sense when I bought it. I was like, whoa. Hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And the investigation piece, again, it can be very deliberate. Like we can we can attempt it and we will do so in practice together of all right, now that I'm present, can I investigate what it's like to be present with just the quality of breath? Can I investigate what it's like to be present with the quality of body? So it's not as though we're learning something entirely new or just learning a way to identify. <clears throat> and the reason it can be so helpful to have these specific labels is then in our practice on our own, and especially on retreat, after a sit, let's say we have a really great meditation sit, we can say, what was present? Like, what was helping me with this meditation? Oh yeah, my mindfulness was there. I was really able to investigate. I felt like present in that investigation of what was happening. And then we'll do these two together as a practice. But interestingly, it definitely can build then into energy, which is the third. So if we are mindful and we are investigating, it's like it really helps with that hindrance of sloth and torpor. So last week we talked about sloth and torpor as one of the hindrances in our meditation practices. Also in our life, some of that requires we just get sufficient rest, we eat well, we don't have like a double burrito before our meditation <laughs> practice, right? Yeah, like, oops, exactly. <laughs> it's like we have like that kind of physiological attunement, but also that I'm interested, like interested in our practice. I feel like investigation helps us be interested. And what we're interested in, we're not bored. We're not like distracted. It's interesting, right? I, I really like that um, kind of pulling those threads together of how our practice builds its momentum. And then from that energy comes a joy. It's so beautiful. Um, I'm sure many people here have experienced that, just that natural feeling of joy when your practice opens up. It's not as though there's some sort of fireworks experience. Maybe you don't even have the deepest life insight, but it's that sense of mindfulness, that sense of investigation, energy to keep practicing. And it feels so good. <clears throat> kind of like a momentum, its own momentum. So, so we'll start with those two. Any questions before? Oh, yes. <sighs> I wanted to say, yeah. Um, curiosity is is what I I think of in terms of what you say. Investiga investigation feels almost like a little bit too active, but this sort of sense of curiosity and then awe, like a sense of like, wow, I didn't even notice this thing was happening, but wow, it's, it's amazing. Um, but yeah. that's kind of my experience. Yeah, beautiful. I think that's that's right. You know, and I like that idea that investigate might sound like interrogate right? Like, oh, I'm trying to get to something. Whereas that curiosity, you know, can really feel like receiving um, and being curious about what's happening. And I, I think it's, um, I think it's interesting to, to even, we can try it in our practice together to notice when we are kind of getting a little tight, when the investigation becomes more like, I'm trying to do this. And then, oh, I'm really curious about this um, and feeling into that. So we're going to do this as some short practices. So this one will be maybe just five minutes, and then we'll move on to the other two factors, do some more practice, and then string them all together. So, yeah, find a posture that feels appropriate. And I think it's nice, even for a short practice, to really give yourself the posture. Um, yes, you can unhook your chairs for more freedom. If you'd like to do so, grab a blanket. For folks at home, this is a chance to pet your animal, your cat or your dog. Get cozy.
And so to support our practice and to support ourselves in settling in, let's bring our attention, our awareness and our mindfulness to the body. Beginning by simply noticing the tactile sensations throughout the body. Letting this noticing be very gentle and curious. And yet having some sense of precision. So maybe we notice areas of sensation around a knee, around a shoulder, different area of the face. Being curious about the quality of that sensation. Maybe it's texture. And we know we've slipped away from our mindfulness and we're carried by thoughts, feelings, fantasies, images. And so returning and releasing whatever has captured our attention and finding this present moment through sensations in the body. The body is always in the present. It's never anywhere else. So we can really tether our mind to the present by becoming gently and kindly aware of what is happening in the body. One of the most prevalent experiences of sensation in the body will be the breath, the rise and the fall. So seeing if we can narrow and shift our attention a bit more to the breath and its undulation in the body. Feeling the whole body as we're breathing in, feeling the whole body as we're breathing out. Very gently, we can check in. Is mindfulness here right now? Am I still in the present moment? See if we can start developing that introspection to recognize when we've been carried away. 
and then gently returning. Mm -hmm. Sharpening our curiosity towards investigation. Start really noticing the nature of breath. Considering the rise and the fall. Considering whether each breath is the same or do the breath slightly shift and change? Is it possible that each breath is unique? Where do we notice the change? Is it in the length in or the length out? And then we'll try, just for contrast, to move from a curious and gentle approach to our investigation to something tight, a little more constricted. So then trying to focus on the breath in a way that's just really bearing down, as though we were really trying to examine really trying to know in some ways control what was happening. Just notice the quality of what that experience is like. Releasing that tension and tightness and then allowing ourselves to go to the other contrast. Feeling maybe a little bit of sloth and torpor and allowing the breath to come and go without so much attention on it. Almost like we can notice and watch what it's like as we start to drift, become dull. And inviting ourselves back into balance, mindfully aware of each breath, curious about what the next breath will be like, receptive and open to the subtle shifts and changes, breath by breath.
Breathing in, dwelling in the present moment. Breathing out, knowing this is a wonderful moment. Before we even start thinking or thinking about talking, just like noticing if there's a quality of mind or presence that is here. And curious from folks, did you notice any, say, like a, a way of feeling? I, I feel like the mindfulness is probably somewhat familiar to folks here, but maybe a new take on it. Were you able to notice the investigation as a, a separate quality? Yeah. Amy, do you want to say anything about it? Um, You're just so per perfectly positioned there to do so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I noticed that I don't remember the specific prompts, but like they made an impression on me in that moment. And what I felt was in the um, period of time where we were accepting, the prompt was just to accept the breath. Yeah. Um, I've never had this before, but it felt like my breath was a friend. Oh, beautiful. it was like, <laughs> yeah. And it was so effortless. And mm. it was just this accepting of it, like, just like this. Like, this is where you're at and I'm here with you. Mm. And the moment that yeah. there was some kind of trying, yes, I felt cut off from the very same breath. And I was like, where did you go? <laughs> Beautiful noticing. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And I, I kind of, I love that, right? It's feeling the aliveness of the body, right? And it alive with us, alive, you know, in us. Um, that can, And I think, you know, the breath... Again, I do think it's probably the hardest meditation practice, which always blows my mind that it's the first one most people learn. So subtle, so easy to get torn away. Um, but yeah, it is also in the present moment and always here with us. Yeah. Other thoughts? Yeah. Well, I just sometimes zone out and get just the weirdest imagery. And so what I had to do to get through graduate school, actually, I had to come up with this thing called the Quantras. And it's questions that you just ask over and over again until you get a useful answer. And what's been coming up for me a lot is when I get this just like, what? What was that? What? Is I'm asking myself, where did that come from? What is its origin? Mm -hmm. Just really curious. That was so bizarre. I wonder where that came from. Hmm. And just finding, looking for origin stories hmm. for my weirdness. Yeah, it's not, I mean, hypnagogic Im imagery is very common in meditation. So often when we're in that kind of liminal state of consciousness, we have a lot of access to different, mind streams essentially um i think that is its own practice of kind of what is mind manifesting and then you know especially where did it come from but without looking for real answer just noticing that mind manifests can be really interesting and then it might be interesting to do some of the the dream yoga practices because that's really where we learn a lot about that imagery that comes up in those liminal consciousness states yeah yes Jorge, please. 
So um, in this practice, I was falling asleep like I normally do. <laughs> and um, you know, I just felt a, a, a very sharp sen sensation in my, somewhere in my nose. And normally it just bugs me and I want to itch it. Yeah. When I just paid attention to it, investigated it, rather than mm. being in, uh, in the state of adversion, yeah, it uh, starts seeing how it starts shifting into a tingling sensation, it goes away. And um, <clears throat> I've done other practices where you just do mental notations. And yeah. It seems that uh, <clears throat> when I do that, it uh, brings me back to the present moment, yes. just investigating. Yep beautiful yeah I, I loved both of those points so one being just that kind of opening up into like you could almost as jason said have awe of the itch in the nose right because you're paying attention to it and it's so it's it's i mean having a body is like pretty amazing right and paying attention to like i remember sneezing on retreat once and just being like whoa like, that was amazing you know just like how many miles an hour is a sneeze like it's something like 30 miles an hour something crazy the energy and so that like really getting into and investigating. And then the other thing um, you brought up, which I love is kind of this like noting or, or labeling practice, which can help bring us back to the present moment and is also a form of investigation. It's such a good one to practice with because sometimes we can become like a bit tight on the labeling too. So I could see how like we did the little tightening and then relaxing that on the labeling, it can get really... Um, and get a little obsessive on it, but it also can really help us identify like thinking, planning, or we could identify different areas of the body. So, yeah. Yes. I had a, um, when you asked, when you invited us to become uh, sort of more tight and more focused, I had a lot of thoughts, suddenly this whole stream of thoughts about getting it right came came mm -hmm. in sort of like am i doing it the right way which hadn't been present before yeah and it made me um you know when we released that and it was kind of into the sloth toper was like yeah whatever <laughs> and, and indifference but it really highlighted for me just a kind of a little thread about that how much that sense of i've got to do it right is is pervasive yeah like it's sort of like the air i breathe i don't even notice it right until it's sort of yeah focused so in a certain way that that was really um very teachable yeah. moment for me to get tight and feel like, oh my God, I'm doing it wrong. So interesting. Yeah. And did you notice tension in the body in any particular yeah, areas? Yeah, very much so. Very much so. It was kind of like leaning forward, tightness. There was a sense of tightness in chest, jaw. Yeah. You know, just this determination that I've got to do it right because I've got to get this right. And mm -hmm. if I don't get it right, then I won't have it right. You know, the yeah. sense. And, and then just, like I said, I think that goes on like all the time. It's just like, I'm just busy getting it right. <laughs> so I don't notice it. Yeah. So that's yeah. really an interesting moment. Yeah. Great noticing. And and I do think that, you know, that kind of more realizing that this kind of tightness, it can be physiological, right? Like we're bearing down, but that there is also maybe a story to it. Right. And that's what you're investigating a little. The story is I'm doing the tightness is I'm doing it wrong. Right. And it could be a different story. It could be like try harder. But there's a, a whole. Um, yeah. Which is interesting, again, because this is the application of mindfulness to mental formations. That's what this is. So we are you're kind of seeing that formation arise. And I do think, I, again, this investigation should show us reality as it is which is unbelievably hard to see. And you're saying my reality is maybe I'm tense about doing it right a lot. Huh. I know for me, the tension, I felt it right between my eyebrows. Like it really was like a, you know, bearing down. Um, yeah. Any other thoughts or, yeah. I was just a little nervous when you talked about investigation because I was interpreting it as kind of a grasping, like mm -hmm. I need to solve a problem or fix something because th that's what I would normally associate with that. But what I loved and I'm interested to get your thoughts on is I kind of approached it in the practice more as experimentation with like different levels of attention and mm. what is it like to hold really tightly. Yeah. And that was interesting to see the results and what is it like to really let go and hold loosely mm. and i think for me i was able to do that 
without kind of attachment to what are the results going to be or trying to get to a certain endpoint. And that feels like a really interesting framework to kind of move forward with, like, mm -hmm. let's try out, let's kind of experiment with attention and see what happens. Yeah, without sort of saying, like, here's the point I need to get to or the problem I need to solve. Right. And and I think what you're saying of there's a, you know, kind of an, an acceptance, right, or an okayness with however it is, mm -hmm. which I think is another way we often hear people talk about mindfulness is there's like this quality of acceptance. Mm -hmm. It's not just being in the present moment. It's like, I, I often think of it as a real generosity with the world, like I'm willing to receive the world as it is, mm -hmm. not the way I want it to be and without trying to control it. Mm -hmm. And that could be our attention. And that could also just be whatever else is coming up in the mind stream and otherwise. And, you know, it's so interesting because, again, we're kind of allowing to be present with whatever arises, not trying to push it away. And then that investigation piece, it like it's just it's like our super highway to wisdom. Like we're really going to start learning if we can just receive and notice what's happening because mindfulness without the investigation it would be a really interesting kind of show we'd see what's happening coming and going but the investigation is like gives us that angle towards wisdom like oh interesting when i'm tight i go you know just and i i prompted us so we could have the contrast but in our normal practice we get a whole bunch of oscillations of that coming and going right the tightening the loosening maybe the deep loosening into sleep right and then so how do we start to really be curious about that and and what it reveals too? Yeah. And again, each of these are, you know, the way that the Buddha taught them, we use them and can use them. I used this word for us as introspection during our practice. So if we're in a practice and we are wanting to be like, is mindfulness here? Okay. Is investigation here? Is this kind of curiosity? I, I like Jason's word, is curiosity here? Okay, check, right? It's almost like those pilots putting on all their little chick, 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 chick before they get their engines going. So we're gonna move on to, this actually gonna be three together, energy, joy and rapture and relaxation. I mean, come on, who doesn't want that? It's, we're gonna have to like, back our way into it a little right because usually again these are really thought of as building on each other because the energy is coming from this combination of mindfulness and investigation the energy that real energy is like often also called a, a determination um effort nobody really likes when we talk about determination and effort because of our culture has not we are really too good at that Right. So we don't want to have it. I like the energy feeling that just what we're interested in, it gives us that kind of vitality of like, I want to be here. And then the joy and the rapture. It's truly, I mean, I, I personally find it like the most satisfying state is that sense of, I think it might be better described as a deep, deep contentment. Joy and rapture almost makes you feel like it should be like ecstatic, you know, like, ah, but it's this, you know, you can almost think of it. Some people like the word flow when you feel really good, when you, your abilities just meet the challenge that's there with you, whether you're rock climbing or dancing or like a problem at work that like, so, and it has that quality of energy and joy and rapture together. Like I'm having the energy and I'm excited. Um, I think it's a really nice uh, combination. And what I think is interesting uh, in the way it's described, I was reading a little, um, some folks might know James, I think you pronounce it Baraz or Baraz from Spirit Rock. Uh, he has a couple beautiful essays on the seven factors of awakening. And he was saying that that joy and rapture, it can actually get you a little too agitated not agitated in the worry rumination way but agitated in the like oh, this is good and that's why you need the relaxation all right so you want to you know really have that kind of sustained contentment that in that case it can't be too um too high energy you have to like balance it with the relaxation 
So we're going to, you know, we're going to explore this and, and the way I'd like to kind of back us into it or give us a little jump start is to do a practice of counting. Counting can really help us kind of get into a flow uh, for folks who haven't done counting of breath before. Very simple. Uh, when you inhale at the very top of your inhale silently to yourself, you say one and then you exhale. Really importantly, as you exhale, you aren't preparing mentally to say two, right? You just completely let it go. And when you're inhaling, you're not thinking, oh yeah, now I'm going to say a next number and then say the number internally and let go. I, I think sometimes with counting, it really gets too focused on the numbers. So there are these really, they're like these little points that just help get our attention aligned and consecutive. So inhaling one, and then as though you were forgetting that you were ever going to say another number, exhale, inhaling, not that you had a number at all, two, exhaling, releasing that, inhaling, oh my God, three, right? You just, you want to really not, I don't know the right word, you just don't want to get too tight on the counting of it. But what many people find, um, that like Jorge described with the labeling, is it gives you just enough to do that your mind can really be at ease. And... Often people do counting to 21. I find that really hard, right? I think we get really distracted. So we're going to go to seven. And the traditional instruction is that if you get distracted, you start again at one. I know it kind of feels like punishment or like you're doing it wrong. But I assure you, it really doesn't matter how far you get. It matters that you're continuing to come back and realize it's amazing. You can be counting and like fully planning your weekend and not realize it until, you know, you're all the way at seven and you're like, wow, I, I don't think I actually paid attention to the last four. And that's no problem, but really trying to have nothing else in your mind other than the breath in, the breath out and that single number. So we'll try that together and see if we can start noticing that sense of energy and see and explore, investigate whether there's some sense of contentment or joy with that presence and then relax with it. So that's what we're going to do. So we're going to do another practice. So again, kind of reestablishing posture. <clears throat> So beginning by re-establishing a sense of attention and awareness, mindfulness in the body, softening through the face, the chest, and the belly. For a couple of breaths, really finding a sense of vividness and attention through the inhale, and then balanced with a sense of ease through the exhale. We'll begin this practice of counting from one to seven. Again, just the quiet noting of each number at the top of the inhale before the exhale. And once getting to seven, just returning again, 
doing a couple rounds and really having a sense of being so curious about the breath, so curious about the sensations of breath and the body, like giving ourselves this little point to help our attention by counting. Main focus is really breath, breath awareness, mindfulness of breathing. And with this simple tool, little support of counting. Checking in and noticing the quality of your attention to the breath. Seeing if curiosity and mindfulness is present. And being honest from when you get carried away. No problem. There's no need to get to seven. The best way we develop our attention is catching on if we've really lost ourselves in a thought memory or image and just starting again.
then taking off this supportive feature of counting and returning to this mindfulness and investigation more fully of breath. Checking in and seeing if we can invite the quality of pliancy to body and mind. Not reaching out towards anything, not trying to avoid anything. With each breath, there is a brand new moment. Unlike any that has been here before, different than anything that will come. So fleeting. Seeing if we can experience that kind of excitement, interest, curiosity. Once again, with introspection, asking ourselves, is there energy here in my practice? Am I engaged? Am I interested? Seeing if there's a way we can bring a bit more vividness, that energy of attention, just continuing to notice and be with this beautiful breath. And on the next breath, consider whether being with this next breath has any quality of enjoyment or contentment. Without looking too far ahead, just noticing, is this next breath indeed a wonderful breath, a wonderful moment? Feel or imagine a smile on the heart.
with this mindfulness of the breath, this real interest and curiosity for each breath. Maybe we feel the energy, dedication to the practice, a sense of warmth, just in the contentment of being with each breath. And once again, checking in and considering is relaxation present? Is there some sense of presence, openness with the mindfulness of breathing? with the interest and curiosity. Just a couple more moments and exploring this consideration that when we are mindful and interested in what we are mindful about, that curiosity, that naturally we feel the energy, the joy, and the relaxation. Thank you for your practice. Any energy or joy come through for people? It's really funny because it's it's hard to you can't force it, right? It it has to naturally come that energy, that momentum. But when you really get cooking with the mindfulness and with that curiosity, it comes. The energy's there. Otherwise, yeah, the dullness, the boredom can arise very easily. Did anybody get a kind of a hit or a little whiff of the energy? I have another teacher who uh, says that, and it's great that you said generosity, mm. that curiosity and generosity are fuels, they're energy sources. Mm. Yeah, beautiful. Eve. Yes, Claudia. Yeah. Um, when we started counting, I was all of a sudden like really surprised. I lie down and I was really surprised to feel as I exhale like a cavity in my stomach, right? I mean, that kind of caught me by surprise. And then we kept on counting. And before you even said later on, watch what you feel in the next step all of a sudden very spontaneously 
my breath, I just had a very lengthy inhale mm. and a very lengthy exhale, very, very deep. Mm. And it was, it just felt like such a gift. I mean, it was like deep sometimes because I do, I do notice the differences in the, in the breath. Sometimes they're shorter, sometimes they're longer, but sometimes they go so deep. Yeah. So satisfying. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. yeah, there is definitely joy there. I mean, there's, there's, I don't know, there is that contentment. I definitely felt it. And it was, it was just wonderful. So. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I can hear it. Uh, I can really? hear that. It is, it's hard to even put words to, because it is, it's such a, yeah, such a just feeling so yeah and it just comes you know i mean it was like maybe at first i was kind of like, like forcing it a little bit by yes being, but then then all of a sudden it's like no counting anymore like who cares you know and it was just being aware of the inhale and the exhale but when it came so so deep i don't know how to explain it I and mean, it's like yeah. it's just like below the diaphragm i don't know how to explain it but yeah. it was so deep yeah it just, it just feels wonderful that's yeah and i think that i think it probably is below the diaphragm because so so many of us really are breathing in our chest not in our belly mm -hmm. and not getting proper breath right and there's so much wonderful research on it and then so many amazing ancient yogic practices on breath to help us have a more full breath in our body. And it is delightful. I mean, it goes all the way to ecstasy, I would say some of the breath practices, but even just that simple connection to our breath. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question, Eve. Or okay. You want to go first? We got one person here and then we'll, we'll go back to you. Yes. Please. Yeah. Um, I was a little bit overwhelmed by the counting at first. Yeah. And just keep getting that voice of like, you have to do it right. <laughs> right. You and Tom have the same voice. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. exactly. That voice. Yeah. And then I start investigating on the nature of my breath. Mm. And noticing it something happened in the stomach i felt mm. something warm um i'm trying to say i'm trying to remember at first i felt i was compressed my body had an image of me being in a sacrifice mm. <laughs> And it did change, and I didn't feel the weight of the body anymore. And mm. the breath started changing. It felt like a light glowing with each uh, mm. breath. Mm. And then I realized I was hungry too. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it, it is beautiful, like the images and even the the set, like the the closeness to breath. Like I really admire and appreciate breath work. What I've gotten to receive and and learn from others, and such an amazing practice that can really get us to an altered state. But I also love like just this natural breath and getting really excited about just our breath as it is. Um, and I think finding, you know, it to be the friend and it to be this depth and joy. And it's just really, um, yeah, it's really inspiring to hear. And again, letting ourselves be so close to it in our mindfulness that it blossoms into this, potentially into this beauty. Um, I know it is, it's, it can be challenging and the mind can go away many times. And yet still, whenever we come back, that possibility is reignited to find it delightful, to find it beautiful. So, yeah, any any other? Oh, Jason, yes, back to you. My, my uh, question is pretty uh, straightforward. It's just the number seven and the number 21. I, I've been uh, encouraged to use seven uh, by 
a teacher and I'm wondering if you have any notes about like why 21 you know is there any significance to the number yeah that's how I learned from my um yeah my first teacher Alan Wallace does 21 and he's a you know a big shamata head a big attention so I think just the amount in a row so going to 21 it gives you like a kind of a greater goal of sustaining your attention. Seven might feel more accessible, which I think is great. Accessible is great. And then the challenge might be interesting to go to 21 and just see, because I, I don't know if you experienced this, but there's a certain point at which the counting can not just feel like, oh, I'm doing it wrong, but it really can start to feel like um a support. I, I do call it training wheels, which might not be fair because it is like its own practice and it's great, but it feels like a training wheels. Like it gets me enough into the energy of paying attention to my breath that I can then let it go. And I'm like, like I said, I've like backed into it. Um, so I think you can use more or like a higher number and that might help a little bit. Yeah. Yes. Can we pass this back? Yeah, no. Um, the breathing component was really um, good in my meditation tonight. And it's just a reflection. I don't know if maybe it's a question comment. Mm -hmm. Is I think it may be why it was really good tonight is that I've been doing some thinking and reading about Anika and impermanence. Mm. And I think the thing about breathing is that it's almost a physical manifestation of impermanence. The minute you're inhaling, you're almost exhaling. The minute you're exhaling, it's as opposed to the breath, it's breathing. It's a it's a verb. Hmm. It's an action. Yeah. And it it just seems to me when it's going right, you kind of tap into that Anika thing. <laughs> And maybe this is an aside, but it's related to me just because of my traditions. I sort of got into Buddhism through like mystical Judaism. Everyone's got their own path. But uh, there's this interesting book called God is a Verb. Mm. And I think the idea is that if you compose, if you think of the sacred and the divine not as a fixed thing, as a noun. Yeah. Is God, but you think of God as a that energy as a force. Mm. It's a verb. God is a verb. It's not a noun. Breathing seems somehow related to that. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I, I can't explain, but it's like yeah. very active breathing is is this verb, this action. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like when when I'm able to, and sometimes I'm not able to um really benefit from it my mind goes in those directions about if you can and then i'll give this up it's not so much that impermanence is nothing or the lack of something it's that the very energy that creates the impermanence the change the constant becoming and unbecoming and reinventing that's the sacred that's the divine that's for lack of a better word god if you want to use it <laughs> and breathing seems to fit so well with all that at least tonight tomorrow it won't that's beautiful i love that and i'm not afraid of the god word i think it's beautiful to bring in you know um i like how the dalai lama describes secular as not um without religion spirituality but inclusive of all and all the ways in because there's so many ways in and i think when you were speaking you know i love this idea of the breath being divine right the breath can we we're saying the breath is a friend a support joy and and why not divine i mean i do think again of the miracle of the human body like unbelievable unbelievable these human bodies and the breath is what sustains us at the most fundamental level and then yeah there's anyway there's there's a a long way to go with that but there's also such an intimacy with our breath it's so personal it's so close and that feels just uh you know this intimacy we can have with the divine right even and 
the exchange within this inner world and the outer world that's happening all the time. It's, I think that's a, a beautiful reflection. So thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Did anyone here like just hate counting? Like, let's never do that again. Yeah, okay. Let's talk about that. <laughs> I wouldn't say hate counting, yeah. but I thought it was curious that uh, one, it was really effective for me to not think of something else. Um, yeah. Two, I started noticing that I was really making it difficult for me to breathe. Oh, interesting. And then I was like, oh, I didn't get enough oxygen. I need to breathe more deeply. And then I yeah. had to reset a few times. Yeah. And we're, so I have close friends that just had a baby. She's two and a half months old. And all of a sudden I started thinking about how newborns belly breathe Yeah, and everything in the body is automatic mm -hmm. and they can suck and swallow at the same time. They don't think about breathing. And so I was thinking, is mindful, is she mindfulness? Mm -hmm. is, is her experience complete mindfulness because she's just experiencing, she can't think about past. She can't think about future. And is it useful for me to think about being more like a small child and less like an adult? when I try to be present and mindful? I think it's a great question. And I think definitely you do hear, at least in terms of body, right? Like when we are breathing and, you know, allowing the breath to come, allowing the breath to go, can our face be so soft and gentle like that of a sleeping baby? So that's, you know, from ancient texts that kind of imagine your face as soft and gentle as a sleeping baby. However, I, I do think the wisdom side of mindfulness does require a bit more understanding, right? So they, they maybe have, the babies might have that access to the naturalness and the sensory naturalness of nothing's getting in the way. And whether or not they're thinking about the past or the future, or who knows? Probably not, right? Um, not that we know of, but there's also not a it, it's interesting to yeah like how far do I want to go into child development um <laughs> consciousness like where does con like well, hmm, yeah it's complicated but I I do think when I think of mindfulness it's it's in some ways being able to recognize there's a duality so until children are about four or five they don't really recognize that things are happening for other people that are different than them, the theory of mind. So everything's really connected, but it's also, there's not, not a wisdom in it. There's a projection to it. So in order to break down the boundaries, we actually, not that we have to build them up, but we have to recognize um, reality as it is, I guess. So it's interesting. Um, I like that question. I feel like that would be a good philosophical debate between like interfaith leaders, right? Is, is our ideal to be like the baby? Um, and I think in some ways, yes. But I do think this cultivation of wisdom and compassion requires a bit more that understanding of self and others, the perceived distance between the two and then breaking down the distance between the two. So, yeah. And did, uh, yes, please. Can I ask a question? Yes, please. Back yeah it's Thanks long so much mm -hmm. um so i'm still kind of like getting used to like meditating yeah um and i think while doing that practice i kind of found myself like not being able to take in a deep breath and as i was counting i wasn't sure what the timing of the counting was but then as i was getting to like the four mark i was like oh i can't breathe anymore mm. and then that was kind of diverting me away from a state of mindfulness so I'm just like wondering how can I kind of like pull myself through and kind of be like okay like let's let's stay with ourselves here and like be able to take that full breath I guess I, yeah it comes with practice but yeah yeah and it's interesting so it was like breathe it felt like there wasn't enough time at the top of the can I just say, oh sorry was it there wasn't like enough time at the top of the inhale because there was like a one and then or sorry oh i'm curious like when did it feel like there wasn't enough time yeah um yeah i was just like maybe i'm not yeah maybe there isn't enough time or maybe i'm like counting wrong or i just right. feel like my chest was like kind of yeah constricting a yeah. little bit yeah um but i don't know if that's like a physiological thing but yeah like, no i think it's great noticing and it is probably a bit of that 
like efforting that's happening. Yeah. And there is, without trying to count, there is a natural pause at the top of the inhale before the exhale. Super short, but there is a little pause. But I could see if you're inhaling and then thinking, oh, I got to count one, one, and then exhale, that it, it can like extend that. Mm. But I, what I'd recommend is to just take, if you want to try the practice again, because some some people do find, I find it really helpful to just like get in, especially if I've had a really busy day with like lots of stuff and I need kind of, I hate the word hack. I don't like it, but a hack. Okay. I'm sorry, I just said it. You need a way in that's like quick a little bit to get you into that I do think it's very effective but if there's if that tightness is happening take a break and just naturally follow the breath because that's probably just needing to relax for a little bit and then come back and try again oh yeah yeah no absolutely and you know this is true not only in just getting comfortable with meditation but all the time so yeah I think it's really nice to remind ourselves that the reset to relax. And and I, I know I've said this here before, but um, sitting on retreat with Alan Wallace for like nine years, not consecutively, but in my nine years of sitting with him, um, what I noticed is like 75% of his answers to everybody's question about practice was relax more, <laughs> truly. So it really is such an important part. And in certain traditions, it's not emphasized. In the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, it's re- the relaxation is primary. And I do think it helps because, you know, we can get really tight, that lung energy, that high wind energy, and um, that doesn't make for an ease- easeful practice. And also the breathing we did at the beginning, the inhaling, the vividness, you can even feel that as an uprightness, and the exhaling release. That could be something to just go back to if counting feels too effortful. So when the vividness, it's almost, it's naturally happens when we're inhaling, it's a little brighter. And then we exhaling, there is ease. And so even giving ourselves that label of vividness, ease, vividness, ease. It's different than counting. Counting is a little more linear and can help in that way. But yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I wanted to riff off that because I had a really quite striking experience of the counting. I wasn't expecting it to be as striking as it was. It was extremely visual. Hmm. Um, I, when I began counting, I immediately realized I, I've done counting before and immediately just like fall off a cliff. And I was like, well, I'm going to, lean on the visual i'll i'll picture the one like in my forehead okay like, like coming that. in being like constructed by the breath hmm. but then it kind of got weird because i that came quite naturally to me but then every number felt very different mm. and i remember the first four uh i'd breathe in it felt like i was breathing in the number and then i was breathing out the four and it got stuck I was like off oh. <laughs> just trying to get it out yeah and then at some point as this this continued and every I got the seven I was like yeah I got the seven and seven and I was like I was I didn't want to let go of this I was like, I'm so proud of myself I got the seven I got the seven in here but I gotta get I gotta get rid of the seven because otherwise I, I I'm gonna need another breath at some point <laughs> and then I came back to one but then it was different and at some point, it was interesting because the um, very quickly I stopped. At the beginning, I, I felt like I was like kind of forcing that imagery, but after a while, it felt more like um, it, it's gonna be a weird metaphor, but it's kind of like uh, I, I remember I was hanging out in Yerba Buena once, and there was this like community dance thing, and it was like all of these school kids who were coming out, and they were like coming on from behind the wings and doing their little thing and they're very proud of themselves the parents would clap then they would like go out and then the next group of kids would come out that's kind of what it felt like it was like number three was like really excited like hey here's what i got to show you and i was like no 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 i'm still number two (laughs) and that continued it was really it, it was um much more pleasurable to see the numbers come than mm-hmm. I could possibly have expected counting to be. Yeah. Um, and, and it was interesting because uh, as it went on, also, it got way more abstract and it felt more like the beginning of the uh, kind of 
oh shit, the four won't leave. It's yeah. stuck. Like it, it felt more like it got integrated with the breath a little mm. bit as I relaxed. But yeah, um, it was it was a very weird experience. It was much weirder than I thought it would be. Wonderfully unique. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, you know, I had a um, a student who described in the counting practice imagining uh, the count from Sesame Street. <laughs> like one, uh, 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 two, and that was her whole practice, which like she, because I was, she cracked up in the middle of counting. And I was like, this is, what is going on here? Um, so I, it's, I think creativity, there is great research to show the relationship between mindfulness and creativity. It can become distracting. And so it is interesting to like, be curious about like, what is it? Am I letting my mind have a way to focus that's supportive or is it like carrying me away um and there's so many wonderful practices that are essentially not only to bring in these kind of beneficial qualities of different deities but to also help us focus is by imagining these deities that are very very specific with how many petals and their colors and their formations and by imagining and holding in our mind we are inviting the qualities of that deity but also really establishing our attention right giving ourselves something to imagine and visualize so visualization can be a very very powerful practice but yeah it's interesting i've never I've never visualized a number. And I would say there's no um, there's no harm that I can see unless the four gets stuck. Uh, but I would be curious about, you know, what it's like in its most simple. Like maybe you start with the image and then you kind of break down there. Um, yeah, because it is interesting in our mind to say one, like to speak in our mind, right? The words is, a, it's also a very subtle feeling. Yeah. I'm trying to think of it. I was wondering, what is the line between a total cop out? I'm just like pretending to meditate, but I'm just playing in Yeah. Versus helpful meditation. Yeah. I think it has to be something where, yeah, like checking out internally, because when it becomes the distraction, we won't have the focused attention. So there's a different quality there. Um, so the the last two, which are concentration and equanimity, we can't just meditate on them, much like those three qualities we just did of the uh, energy, the joy, and um, the relaxation. They kind of naturally arise with our mindfulness. But I really do like kind of highlighting, especially the the equanimity. Um, that is maybe some of you had a, a glimpse of it in the practices of just that ability to be with whatever is coming and to accept, you know, the fluctuations of the breath, but also to feel that sense of peace and balance altogether. So, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I do, I'd be curious for folks, you know, seven factors of awakening, very easy to find online and just in investigating your own practice like being curious, like which, what is present or what is missing from my practice. It's just, a, it's a good checklist for our meditations and for our kind of self-reflection and self-work to look at these factors. Um, people teach absolutely, you know, month-long retreats on these seven factors. We are just kind of touching them lightly. They will return again because in in this uh, book, you see over and over the same teachings coming back, coming back. It's so beautifully circular. It's not always these new insights. It's how do we weave in these like simple things over and over. So we aren't totally done with them, but we are at least done for tonight. And next week, we'll be back to more stories. I'm so glad. I mean, the I love how these stories almost like parable, like just show us the living quality, right? So in how Buddha is interacting with others, we get to see, you know, his equanimity. And then in his practice, we get to see how he's developing um, all of these aspects. So I am excited for that. Let's take a, a moment to dedicate the merit of our practice.
Yeah, and just feeling the sense of having gotten closer to what mindfulness really is in our practice and with our breath, just see if you can drop right back to that sense of curiosity. And sense of presence with the breath. And allowing you know, the full expression of the present moment to arrive and be inhabited. And then if it's comfortable putting hands together in front of the heart as a symbolic gesture of offering connection and considering that there may be some benefit from the time we have spent here together. There's a possibility that we've had insights or a sense of calm and ease. And part of our practice is offering up whatever it is that we are benefiting from for the sake of all beings. And so with these words, we enact this gesture of offering. May all beings know peace and ease. May all beings feel belonging and love. May all beings be free. So great to be with you all. Thank you for coming and sharing and fully being here. Um, I think we have some announcements. I said this last week, we're doing a retreat at Big Bear in October, last week of October, full week. Be really lovely. Um, if anyone here can make it, there's some flyers outside the door. I'm doing a, a free talk online tomorrow <clears throat> on emotions and burnout. I'm excited. It's a uh, Mind and Life Institute. Some folks may know them. It's just, I think it's at 11 a.m. Kind of forgot about it. But uh, apparently there's 900 people signed up. So it's exciting. <laughs> Please come <laughs> if you like. Um, it doesn't mean they're going to come, but I was like, well, no pressure. Um, what what else is happening here this week? Okay. Yes. I have three announcements. Great. Um, 